Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Angela Peacock. I am a subject of the film Medicating Normal. I was also trained as a social worker and a therapist, but was harmed by psychiatric medication I took as prescribed. That caused me to become part of this movement about bringing attention to different ways to look at the mental health care system and the way that we treat people with distress. I also volunteer doing outreach for the film, and we host conversations like this one. This is our 26th interview, and today our guest is Christina Kaiser. We know Christina from Twitter. I always enjoyed her tweets when I was going through this experience, maybe like four or five years ago. I think it's been quite a way back, so quite a ways back. But I also got acquainted with her through her work with the Akathisia 101 courses, which are put out by MIST. And if you remember a couple of weeks back, we interviewed Wendy Dolan. If you didn't get a chance to see that episode, you can go back because Wendy and Christina work together pretty closely on these topics. They both lost loved ones. So let me read your her bio. Christina Kaiser has more than 25 years of professional experience in communications and education, having worked for several nonprofits, corporate headquarters, and school districts in California and the DC area. She became an advocate for public health and safety in 2013 after the avoidable death of her teenage daughter, Natalie. Christina has provided FDA testimony, presented at national and international conferences focused on crisis and risk, and authored numerous articles relating to medical harm, informed consent, and akathisia. Christina is a co-developer co of the MIST Akathisia 101 course, which is available online and free to all. Originally from Ohio, Christina holds a bachelor's in journalism, a master's in communications, and several inter interdisciplinary teaching credentials. Her advocacy and leadership training includes Loan Institute's Right Care Alliance, the Center for Creative Leadership, and the Association for Career and Technical Education. Christina is a board member at the USA Patient Network. Christina, would you like to share a few words about yourself and kind of say hello to our audience? Well, hello everyone. Thank you for listening. And Angie, thank you for having me on the show today. You did a good job on the bio. It sounds more impressive than I feel, but I think my, my, my biggest strength is that I, I was witness, personal witness to my daughter's prescribed demise and uh, her tragic and avoidable ending. And what I'd like to do today is uh, tell a little bit about my, my daughter's uh, prescribed demise as you walk us through with the questions. But my biggest uh, goal is to share what happened to our family and then leave our listeners with the takeaway, many of them already know, that this is just a, a micro view of a systemic global epidemic. And while every story is unique, uh, they all share common threads of, of deceit, medical gaslighting, medical error, lack of informed consent, um, hidden clinical drug trials, no transparency, and for the doctors that are prescribed them or the consumers who are the unwitting guinea pigs. And so as you walk us through the questions, I'd like to talk a little bit about what that systemic failure and deceit, uh, what it did to my family and how it impacted my daughter who died at 19 and about eight weeks old, 19 years, eight weeks, she was a college freshman. After Natalie died, we can get into it later, but let's just say that my hat is off to so many advocates I have met since 2013 that have been prescribed harm or have loved ones who are no longer with us because they were prescribed harm that ended in iatrogenic death. And I, it's too much to mention everyone, but I would not be here today if I didn't have, um, if I hadn't had found so many people long before Natalie even started to be poisoned. So many people that were brave and shared their stories, but also brave professionals that have put their medical career in harm's way in order to make sure that prescribed harm is reduced. So I just want to thank people I know personally and professionally and others that I maybe haven't met yet, but that I, I benefited from their work. So thank you. Yeah. So, so to start us off, let's talk about Natalie. And it's always, it's always hard for me to talk to people that have had had such tragedy, but we talk about it in an effort to like bring awareness to it. So can you share a little bit about Natalie, her entry into the mental health care system and kind of what happened? Absolutely. Oh, I know you did a great job of putting the links to some articles I've written in the past and some um, wonderful 
uh, like a documentary by Kevin P. Miller that was just amazing and I'll get to later. But um, the short summary is that Natalie was a incredibly intelligent, mature child. I don't say that as a proud mother, but I was a proud mother, but that's not really here or there. But in kindergarten, her teacher said to me, uh, your daughter won't be able to stay in a regular classroom. This was when she was five or six, that she will have to go to a gifted program. And lo and behold, two years later, we moved to a new area, Fairfax County Public Schools, one of the 10th largest school districts in the country and supposedly one of the best. But anyway, in second grade, Natalie scored a 99 percentile on a Naglieri test, Jack Naglieri out of George Mason, my alma mater for my master's, developed the test. But long story is that test, the Naglieri assessment test, is given nationally to identify students who are advanced academically. Natalie scored in the 98th or 99th national percentile, and the school district said that, you know, we have this program outside of your neighborhood at another school that's not our neighborhood school. And that's where we send at this time. It's, it's awful to say because all kids have gift, gifts and talents and they call this program the gifted and talented program. So there are a lot of other reasons as a former educator, I object to the terminology. But anyway, cutting to the chase is that when she moved to the new school around age eight or nine, nine, I think it was, but we noticed Natalie started exhibiting some what we believed was social anxiety. And uh, I was married to her father at the time. So it was when I say we, that's who also noticed it. And I come from a family um, that used to believe strongly in uh, psychiatry and used to believe strongly in the medical field as a, a healing field. And um, a very loving family member who went to Case Western Reserve for her master's was in the social work field. Uh, Cleveland Psychoanalytical Institute, definitely this loving family member had all the good intentions, but uh, suggested we see a psychiatrist. Now, at the time we saw the psychiatrist, we absolutely never intended, never thought it was necessary, never imagined. And I think a lot of people can resonate with this. We never imagined that that, that would be drugging because we were seeking cognitive behavior therapy, talk therapy. And um, I do come from a family that has Ivy League doctorates and Natalie's uncle was a general uh, a medical internist in Arkadelphia, Arkansas. So he was obviously a prescriber of these drugs and maybe still is. But I came from a family that valued degrees and you know Harvard and University of Pennsylvania backgrounds, yada, yada, yada. And I falsely believed at the time that you know I want my child to see the most experienced, best, educated, most credentialed healer, if you will. And I, that was my mistake. Number one is that I always say, if you go to a surgeon, you're going to get surgery. And although I don't, I don't wish to, uh, you know, paint a whole field in a bad color, so to speak. I think what happened, the family member who recommended a psychiatrist for cognitive behavior therapy probably didn't realize at the time, from the time she got her master's and degrees at a well-respected university, how much the field of psychiatry had changed from gestalt therapy um, and analysis to drugging. And so that was my, I mean, I wouldn't be here today if I hadn't gone to a psychiatrist for talk therapy, what was intended. Now, I do want to say, so I don't get, I mean, obviously you get labeled when you speak out and that's just okay with me because I, I don't want to serve a plate of truth to someone who won't partake in the plate of truth I, I have to serve that's factually accurate. But I will say that um, had I, yes, a lot of general practitioners prescribe drugs that are marketed as antidepressants. I get that. In my case, I would just say it was the field of psychiatry that continued to harm us and, and gaslight us. So she went to the psychiatrist, back to the story, and within about, I want to say, look at the records, but within easily eight weeks, so within several visits, we were told that Prozac would be a great thing for Natalie. Now, I have to tell our listeners that you have to remember back then, this was uh, about 2004, 
and it was October. It was actually her 10th birthday. So about December, 2004, October, about 2003. Why that matters is that there wasn't any information available for a person like me. Yes, I have a communications background. I'm a pretty intelligent lady. I was a diligent full-time parent. All that didn't matter at the same time, because one, every question I asked and knew to ask wasn't really accurately answered um, for a variety of reasons. And two, there wasn't a black box warning or any real information on the internet. I hardly used the internet back then. I think I might've put some recipes on the internet, but that was it. So today there's a lot more information. I have to just say that because people get confused even today to think that the black box warning, which Matthew Downing was very instrumental in helping put on and Kim Witsack, they were considered them my friends and colleagues. That black box warning, and I, I really do appreciate all efforts by uh, my friends who helped at that. The problem is that it had unintended consequences in that doctors, poo poo the black box warning because it's not, it's a guideline. So if I have information that can save your life or help you make an informed decision about a drug, but I don't have to share it with you. That's what I call sick. That's a sick, sick business. And so what happens, and I've sat in court trials to include the Dolan trial out of Chicago. And you see that uh, although the black box warning wasn't for uh, Stuart Dolan's age, obviously, if you looked at the clinical trials, it should have been. But you have doctors that don't share the black box warning or say, oh, they put that on everything. Or when something bad happens, it's avoidable. The pharmaceutical companies don't take responsibility because they then, they, they, then, then, they then say, well, th th we have the black box warning. It's not our fault that the doctor didn't share it. So to get back to Natalie, she got Prozac. She changed immediately. Um, just, she had never had any behavior problems. I mean, Natalie was a model child. I don't say that is a bragger, but I think she was always the one that people would always say that she was, you know, diligent and helpful. But the Prozac, years later, we learned after she died, it caused um, serotonin toxicity and it caused drug-induced mania. And it also very much caused her to under assess risk. So her personality changed and she took risks, even at 10, that just bad choices, I would say at the time, but I realize now, and school districts do this too, how do you hold accountable people for supposedly poor choices when they have been chemically abducted and their decision-making is impaired? And I think the problem with schools a lot is that they, they do push drugs, we'll get into that later, but they don't push education about adverse drug effects. So they encourage teachers to refer people for screening, but then when the child gets a drug that's a toxin and actually has adversely impact that child, they don't, the teachers don't, aren't even asked to report back or when they further deteriorate from the medical intervention that's harming the person that the professional claimed to help, they get more drugs. So with Natalie, you can see on Kevin P. Miller's film, she, um, I rushed her to the hospital on Prozac. She wrote down at the hospital, I wish I could stop thinking about wanting to kill myself. Well, at age 12, I can tell you Natalie, who did not get the drug product for depression, she got it for mild anxiety. These symptoms were not part of Natalie's possible concerns about changing schools. I will say before we go on is that uh, about a year and a half before Natalie was killed, and I do say was killed, she shared with me something that I don't think when she was young thought was knew the significance of it. But when I say that Natalie's journey into mental health um, tragedies was precipitated by my thinking that she was having mild anxiety from changing schools. Natalie was having mild anxiety. and She was having a normal reaction to an abnormal traumatic experience. But about 18 months before her final and fatal prescriber, I learned that Natalie had had a traumatic experience. She was exposed to traumatic things online that no child should be exposed to. And she was very sensitive. And I think the 
trauma that was put upon her at a young age that I learned about very late was why she was experiencing social anxiety. So I wasn't wrong in terms of recognizing that she had social anxiety, but I did not, nor did all of her professionals find the right source. And I do say I, blame's not the right word, but I hold accountable her therapist of which she had many because the question should be asked, what happened to you? Not what's wrong with you. And that is one of the tenets today, how we all got here is that people didn't ask what happened to you. Yeah. So, so basically Natalie was prescribed psychiatric drugs and she was a patient in the mental health care system from age, what was it? Nine to 19. Yeah. And then she ultimately died by suicide, but we refer to as she was killed. Yeah. I, I, I don't, um, I and medical professionals that are in the know or are honest would refer to these deaths as uh, not deaths of despair, but iatrogenic uh, deaths. And I'm not offended by the word suicide, but I don't as a parent of a daughter who was poisoned and died in iatrogenic death. I don't have any kind of, uh, I guess what one would call a typical feeling of why did that happen? And oh my gosh, you know, what did I miss the signs? I can tell you the signs I missed were of toxicity and they were physical and mental and obvious signs because after Natalie died, when I talked to several experts, some of them reported me for 90 minutes, it was, it was unbelievable what happened. So let's just uh, go real quick. So when she went to the hospital with Prozac induced suicidality, they didn't tell us that the drug had a black box warning at the time. They never said, oh, well, this drug, by the time you started getting it from your first prescriber, and we were, we were still seeing, now has a black box warning. If you can imagine going to uh, a well-respected hospital in Fairfax, Virginia, outside of DC, your child all of a sudden is suicidal and you can't figure it out why. By the way, the doctor who prescribed it to her had told Natalie to take a medication holiday and stop the drug cold turkey to see how she did in the summer. So when we talk about withdrawal, Natalie is a textbook case for a poor 12 year old in 2004 or five that was told to take a medication holiday and stop Prozac. And that's where the suicidality came in. And when we got to the hospital, there was a black box warning. We left the hospital. I still have the paper if I ever finish book. And it says, here's what to know about Prozac. And the only listing it had on there after she, Natalie had suffered a Prozac induced almost possible death. The only thing they said on there was possible nausea. They didn't even say that it could have been responsible and likely was what happened to Natalie. They didn't say they had a black box warning, but worse, they did what a lot of prescribers do. They added more drugs. And I know, Angie, I'd like to hear a little more about your story. I know you and Dave uh, from the Naval Academy and MIT, several veterans like both of you, um, were polydrugged and Natalie was polydrugged because they gave her Risperdal. And you can read more about this on the risk.org site that has a wonderful series, uh, a kid called Kidnap. And so basically that's how she got down this path. And I will just say, once you have an adverse experience, adverse reaction to a, a risky toxin as Natalie did, that happens to have psychiatric side effects, it's almost like you're doomed because unless you find someone who knows what the real cause is or isn't afraid to tell you, you, you get labels and labels that are really serve to help the prescriber. And then people don't believe you or they don't believe the parent or they, or they never bother to go back and say, what was the baseline of this teenage girl in your case or in my case? What was the baseline? How did you get on this drug? Oh, it wasn't depression. But um, I'm sure our listeners know this, but I'd, I'd like to say that what you experienced as a teen, and you can talk more about this, is what happened to Natalie later. Uh, she got off the drug. She had some several good years and another she was seeing a counselor who I really liked and I know she cared for Natalie, but she very wrongly suggested Natalie see a psychiatrist. Well, Natalie was suffering from withdrawal then too, 
we didn't know it, but she had been on Prozac for a long time and then the cold turkey and then the Risperdal and then the, and Risperdal, by the way, at the time now, they was prescribed that years later, now they never lived to see it. But Johnson and Johnson uh, paid the largest criminal fine at the time for criminal behavior for uh, largest fine for their criminal behavior for illegally marketing that drug to children. So it's, it's a really, it's a really unfortunate uh, multi-systemic, I guess, yeah. deceit. Yeah. And then uh, she died 2013, February 6th. I wanna get into this real quick and then we'll go back to the questions. She called her prescriber on February 4th, 2013. Natalie was a freshman in college. She worked at Walgreens in the beauty aisle. She was you know, on her way. She was wanted to get off the drug and had tried to get off Zoloft before, but again, was no given no information about how to give up, get off Zoloft. Even wrote a letter to her friend, you know, I wanted to get off Zoloft because I feel fine, but I need Zoloft because when I stopped taking it, I was suicidal and cried all the time. So she documented, documented how the drug was harming her, but she just didn't know exactly what it was in part because the prescribers tried to convince her that what she suspected wasn't true. Uh, so she died, I'm sure, uh, psychotic and hopeless, but I know she was psychotic when she died from the Zoloft because what happened was she called the doctor on February 4th, 2013. They had a regular appointment scheduled. She told the psychiatrist, I can't come in. I feel very sick. I think I have the flu. Um, I, and she must have cried on the phone. I'm pretty sure she did too, because what this psychiatrist did who had prescribed Natalie the Zoloft is she immediately told Natalie without ever seeing her. This was not even a Zoom call. Remember, this was just a phone call. She told Natalie, who had the toxin in hand, to start taking the maximum legal dose of Zoloft allowable. Natalie was barely 19. She was tinier than me. She was 110 pounds. So on Monday, February 4th, she was suffering terribly from serotonin toxicity because the doctor had already increased the drug in response to what she didn't understand was akathisia. So when you keep giving somebody more toxin, they often die. And so on February 4th, after that conversation, Natalie on February 5th took 200 milligrams of Zoloft as instructed. On Wednesday, February 6th, she took, she went to the orthodontist that morning. She had a normal appointment. She expressed excitement about getting her braces off soon. She made an appointment for the next month, which is very forward thinking. She came home and she did her homework for a college class. She printed it out. She baked me Valentine's cookies. She was very artistic and very meticulous. And I, she had the whole plate of Valentine's cookies that you made that she sprinkled and ice and she texted friends about her weekend plans and she took somewhere between the time she got back from the orthodontist and the time of her violent, hideous death, she took the 200 milligrams again for the second day. And um, before she died, she was trying to write down, I think uh, before she was totally delirious, she was trying to write down what was happening to her because on her nightstand, it said, I keep coughing up blood. It's time to, I'm not, I have no appetite or I'm not hungry. I have the note. It's time to take my meds. And also she had complained terribly, terribly of insomnia. And uh, when the forensic technologist got into her computer, the last thing Natalie ever did within probably a minute and a half before violently dying, if you can imagine this, she downloaded a lullaby because she had, she wanted to sleep. She had had terrible insomnia. So I don't think, even if you write a note and say, I'm sorry, you, this doesn't mean the person, the coroners always get this, often get this wrong. You know, you can arrange to do a, a shooting at the mall when you're psychotic on this, these poisons, these drug induced psychosis. It doesn't mean that you knew what you were doing. You know, even if you planned it all, went to the store and got a rope. It just, people don't want to understand that, but that is the case. And, and in Natalie's case, I'll just end with two things. On her nightstand, the night before she died, she shared with me a book that she was reading. And she was a very healthy girl, very much into, you know, she was a vegan and she was a normal weight and she exercised. 
but the book, if you can imagine, the book that she was reading the night before she died that was left next to her note was entitled, Eat This and Live. It was all about how to have healthy nutrition to live a longer, happy life. Because what was happening is she was trying to, as Kim Witzak says, that Woody Witzak said, beat this feeling in her head. She was trying to do everything to live and she couldn't survive the last drug-induced psychosis from Zoloft. Had I gotten home from, I was a high school teacher at the time, a marketing coordinator. Had I gotten back earlier than I did, uh, you know, possibly I would have seen that she was almost comatose because she had some periods of catatonia, I know now. But the problem with this drug-induced toxicity is that the way it was explained to me and what I've read now that I've become a pseudo expert without wanting to be, is that the drug Zoloft maximizes in about five to six hours. And Natalie was experiencing drug-induced psychosis from the time intermittently that the doctor falsely and incorrectly, I should say, increased the toxin. And so this time with the 200 milligrams of Zoloft in two days, she wasn't able to just survive that. Um, if I had gotten back earlier, it's possible I would have been able to put it together. But I do want to stress that I wasn't told that the doctor had uh, further drugged my child. I wasn't told, nor was Natalie, that you're supposed to be closely monitored. None of this happened. I didn't even know that the doctor had over the phone at that time told Natalie to take more. But what I did know is this, the reason that the FDA has the black box warning that does say, you should be closely monitored and caregivers informed to watch for and report any unusual changes in behavior is because while well, Natalie didn't get this for depression, it can cause a lot of bad things like depression. But what happened to Natalie is she was being poisoned and physically there were very big signs of drug toxicity that if the doctors, all of them, if these prescribers had done their job, I was such a diligent mother and Natalie was very much into healthy behaviors that I would have been able to report what I saw, even though I wouldn't have been able to tell you the word akathisia or tell you serotonin toxicity. But I do wanna just give you a list of these five and then allow you to go on to your question. You've been so patient. So to watch a person being poisoned to death through SSRIs, this is what I witnessed. Uh, a week or so before her death, after the first increase of Zoloft, she, I went to take her to her college class and she oddly said, I hope I can find the building. And I said, well, Natalie, you've been going there for months because her last semester classes were in that building. So I was like, that's kind of confusing. Um, about four days before she died, I came home from work and she said, mom, I know what's wrong with me. And I was thinking, what do you mean what's wrong with you? And she said, I know what I have. And I said, what are you talking about what you have? And she said this strange word. And I remember the word she said, it was paresthesia or whatever. But what she did is she said the strange word that she obviously saw on, the, on Wikipedia. And she said, it's called, it's uncontrollable skin picking. Well, the uncontrollable skin picking that she had is clearly the toxicity from serotonin toxicity in the bazillion milligrams of Zoloft. But another thing that happened is, um, aside from the insomnia, the skin picking, the lo lo loss of memory, is that um, the night before she died, she said, you don't know what it feels like to wake up in the middle of the night and I can feel my skin crawling. And the last thing I ever saw of Natalie, the last time I saw her alive, was less than 24 hours before she died. It was Tuesday evening. And when I went to hug her goodnight, she said, don't hug me. It reminds me I have a body, a hideous body. And I remember when she said that, they were getting ready to go to the beach for spring break. And I remember when she said that, I knew this is very dis disturbing to me. This is not how Natalie talked, but I didn't understand the full significance. And I thought maybe she was just tired or had the flu, as she said, but the my, the head is better, separate from your body from phenomena. I think Healy and many other experts can attest that that is something early on was became apparent in these lawsuits that 
the pharmaceutical companies knew this dirt depersonalization was absolutely drug induced and it wasn't just depersonalization. But then Natalie got up and when she was walking back to her room, I would just say she was walking with her legs very far apart, almost like a football player who's standing to, you know, to, to do the next, you know, pass. And I remember when I saw her shuffling her feet, she was wearing slippers, but she was shuffling and her legs were really far apart. And I said to her dad, I wonder if Natalie cut herself shaving or maybe she has a rash because something is wrong with the way she's walking. And I had planned to ask her the next day, but she, she didn't survive. But what that was is the change of gait because SSRIs build up in this case in the front lobe of the brain, the toxin build up there. And so Natalie didn't realize that um, it was affecting her balance. So she wasn't consciously aware that she is being poisoned. She wasn't consciously aware that she was walking differently, that her gait had changed, but the body has to uh, try to fight back the chemical imbalances that are prescribed. And so she was walking with the very wide stance and shuffling her feet. And that's why uh, I thought that she was maybe cut herself shaving or had a rash because I couldn't figure it out that she didn't want her thighs to touch, but that wasn't it. She didn't know what was happening. And that's the end. Um, I will just say that um, after she died, I had to fight the coroner to get her blood because the coroner didn't test for the things that in this kind of prescribed demise you should test for. It's very difficult to believe that I could have produced this wonderful human being and that indeed I made her blood and that after she died in order for me to try to find out what happened to my child I mean I knew it was the drug but I didn't know what the names were and what why this occurs and how frequently but the coroner I was really at her mercy because she said if I have any blood left over if there's enough I'll, I'll let you take it somewhere but um the, by the time I got the blood samples, it was too late to test for certain things because the blood can't be frozen that long. But what I did test for, and I want to say, is um, they tested for, an independent lab tested for liver enzymes. And Natalie, from the very first day that she was wrongfully prescribed SSRIs, she did not have the ability to destroy the toxins as fast as they were prescribed. Mm. Well, th well, thank you for sharing all that. Um, we are halfway through, so I just want to give you a time marker that we're halfway Thanks. through. And we've still got a lot of questions, but um, all right, go ahead. So, so here I'm going to bring myself in a little bit. That um, I, you know, you know, you know this because we've had conversations on the phone. That I experienced a lot of what Natalie did. I even had that gate change at the end, and I remember people in the hospital saying, "Pick your feet up. Why are you stomping down the hallway?" And I was like, "What do you mean? I'm just walking." You know. Terrible. So that was a memory that I just got back while you were talking about that. But mm -hmm. when I came off of all the drugs, which is part of the film, uh, showing that how that how hard right. that can be, um, I knew what was happening to me was drug induced, and I don't. I didn't, I figured it out very quickly. Thank God. Because if Absolutely. I hadn't figured it out, I would have thought like, this is a mental illness. I need to go to the hospital. I Absolutely. need to go to meds, you know, all this. So I knew that it was drug induced. And so kind of what I did to, to protect myself and protect my narrative was to kind of keep it quiet. But then I would, you know, slowly try to fight back and like, tell my doctor, like I'm experiencing benzo withdrawal. Here's some studies. You should read them. And I would bring studies to his office and he would not read them. But I knew that if I killed myself, they would say, oh, well, she's just a disgruntled veteran and she had PTSD. Absolutely. And, yeah. and, and, and they may use your, you, your life as a statistic to right. ask for more funding to drug more people. And I, so I, part of the reason I stayed alive was so that would not happen, you know, but again, we're different than Natalie. Cause I knew more information than she, right. she had. Okay. So I don't want to negate she what was happened. searching. She you know, was looking, yes. yeah. But so anyway, so that's so the topic is the truth. Like we know what happened to us. I know what happened to me. It's taken me a very long time to be able to talk so openly about it. And sometimes when I talk about it, I know people around me are like, "You are a crazy lady. Like a drug didn't do this to you. You're just crazy, right. you know." Or right. that doesn't happen. Or you know, even my own uh, 
physician that I see, you know, every six months because I have to at the VA, she's like, no, nah, that, that doesn't happen. You know, even my functional medicine doctor, nah, I just think that you had toxicity, but I'm like, no, I know what happened to me. Oh, I was normal. And then I wasn't, I was working out five to six times a week. And then I wasn't. And the only thing that happened between there was being taken off a drug, cold Turkey. I know what happened. Okay. So can you talk about like you sharing your story about Natalie, you knowing the truth, you knowing what happened and like, how is that received? And I don't know, talk about your truth and what you know to be true. Well, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the, the reminder of the time because there are some very important topics that you brought one up that I want to, yeah. so knowing your truth, I want to say that um, parents are the experts in their children. And I was the expert in my daughter and I am the expert, I think in my son who's an adult now, but in terms of when he was growing up. So mothers, it used to be in society that in all societies, whether it's Ireland or here, that, you know, mother knows best. Mother knows best was a, you know, just a catchphrase, but everybody understood what it meant. And I think what's happened is that when we talk about sharing our truths, a lot of parents, even well-informed ones and diligent ones, um, they, are, they are denied their truths, but they're also denied the recognition that they are experts in their in their children. And what happens is I think the medical industry and the psychiatric industry and the pharmaceutical industry, they have um, for financial benefit created a paradigm where the shift has gone from mother knows best to mother knows nothing. Mm -hmm. And when that mother who does know best speaks up and it doesn't support the sales of drugs, polydrugging, more $160 hour long talk therapy appointments that are really nothing but drugging. Then they turn on the mother. And I would just say that I, after it was all said and done, and I started looking closely at Natalie's records, I couldn't believe the animosity that all of her prescribers had against me. And it was just, I was just shocking, but it was like, on one of the prescribers, it said, mother thinks Zoloft is causing nightmares. Mother wants daughter off Zoloft. If I ever do a book, I'm just going to take pictures of these things. This is not, you know, this isn't me talking. And then one time, you know, it was questioned on whether the mother wants the child to get better. I mean, it, it, it was bizarre. It was like the bottom line is that the final prescriber for Natalie didn't have a daughter of her own. And there's something in analysis called uh, triangulation and it's kind of like two against one but I think Natalie's final prescriber who cried terribly at Natalie's funeral and her truth came about after she prescribed my daughter a fatal dose of drug is that when we called her fatal prescriber and said Natalie was dead the psychiatrist started screaming with city of Fairfax I'd gone to a female psychiatrist thinking that Natalie would have a connection with the female but Anyway, she started screaming, oh my God, oh my God, it doesn't make sense. I just saw her, she wasn't depressed and the woman was uh, you know, freaking out. And yeah, you didn't just see her because a phone call is not seeing a patient. Yeah, you increased the drug a second time to the maximum legal dose and you didn't give her a follow-up for two weeks and she was dead 20, four, two days later. And oh, by the way, yes, you're right. She wasn't depressed, but there is no excuse for doctors today, when it comes to people under the black box warning, I would argue the other, it's not all people, but in terms of you know, legal, there's no excuse for any doctor, psychiatrist or general practitioner to prescribe SSRIs to people you know, 25 and under and not know about akathisia and not know that these drugs cause depression and not know that you can't get off of them cold turkey and take a medication holiday. But well, I and, wanna... and, and to not know the black box warning is a real thing. It literally says it can Absolutely. cause suicidal thoughts and behaviors in teenagers. Now I mean, that's debatable it, for your, I was in my twenties and it happened to me. So I don't think there's a time limit. Like the drug knows when you're 18 and when you're 19. Yeah. That, a pill doesn't that, know your that, age. It doesn't say it doesn't. happy birthday, Angie, as soon right. as you're 25. <laughs> but, but to, so, and I, I, this keeps coming up in conversations that the black box warnings, even me, I read that and I didn't think it would happen to me. 
And then when it did, it wasn't recognized as this is a drug effect. The patient should be taken off of it. It was no, this is a part of their mental illness. Let's give them another drug to, to stop the suicidal thoughts. Okay. Right. So, so anyway, I just want to make that point there. Well, I'm, I'm so glad we talked about the black box warning because I want to bring up Christine Mortier of American, uh, the AFSP. I really would urge our listeners to please in your own time, it's painful material, but it's poignant and powerfully important. That is that um, the American Foundation of Suicide Prevention, is the chief medical officer is Christine Mortier out of Columbia University in New York. They have some, AFSP has some pretty fancy offices for a nonprofit. But anyway, I knew Natalie didn't die by suicide and I was disturbed when at that time people would, her, her friends wanted to do something to honor Natalie. And the only thing, I mean, they were teenagers. The only thing they could think of is this out of the darkness walk. And I was like, well, I don't want to, I don't want to deny as a, as a, an educator and a communications professional who cares about kids and knows a lot about childhood development from birth to young adulthood. I didn't want to deny her friends the opportunity to help move through their grief. But I knew that AFSP in this out of the darkness walk was kind of, I thought, well, this isn't really having to do anything to do with Natalie because this is not what happened. But since there's not a walk for, you know, reduce adverse drug effects, well, 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 I'll let them do it. So anyway, we did the walk and about, I want to say maybe I have it on my log, my call log, but I called Christine Mortier. I called the uh, AFSP headquarters and they put me on the phone with this Christine Mortier. You can read about this in the Fitiman blog. I think it's pretty extensive. But anyway, I called to ask her why they wouldn't advertise a black box warning and that my daughter and other people like her might have been alive, might live, might live if they had advertised a black box warning appropriately and if they would talk about akathisia. Because if you're feeling suicidal and you find out the drug can do that, at the very least, you're going to check into it before you keep taking it and then jump off the bridge unknowingly or intentionally. So Mortier, I couldn't believe it. She said to me, what was wrong with your daughter? And I said, well, that's a really good question, Dr. Mortier, because as the drugging continued, the educated guesses by her prescribers changed because as their symptoms changed, it was just a guess. And finally, at the end, it was so sad that Natalie got drugs she didn't need and she never even got a diagnosis that was accurate. And it was like mood disorder otherwise unspecified, which by the way, the APA doesn't even use anymore. Not that I have great respect for the APA, but, um, but anyway, so Christine Mortier asked me about Natalie's symptoms. And I want to say real quick, because I never got an answer from my vitamin blog and my letter to Mortier. So I told Christine Mortier, I said, you know, at the time she died, she thought she had an unspecified eating disorder and depression because after she died, I found some things where she was talking about this new obsession she had about food and germs. But it clearly is, and I also shared this with medical experts, as the drug was increased, she developed these pseudo obsessions about food and germs. It was not innate to Natalie. This was not part of Natalie. They absolutely were drug induced and they would have subsided if she had gotten some help to taper off and reduce the toxin with the hope of one day not being having to take it. But anyway, um, this is the fascinating part. Christine Mortier tried to tell me, can you imagine doing this? Tried to tell me, never meeting my child. Well, you know, the suicide rate for teenage girls with eating disorders is quite high. And that was just like, okay, whoa, you are not gonna gaslight me. And, and you've never, if, if you were concerned, Christine Mortier of AFSP, wouldn't you wanna see my daughter's records? So Christine Mortier said, oh, I'd like to see a picture of Natalie or whatever. It might be the way she ends every phone call. So later I did the Fitman blog and I sent Christine Mortier the letter and said, here I am, I've come back to your out of the darkness walk. And there I was in DC area with pictures of uh, risk.org and mist and it, and you could see them online that, you know, akathisia is caused by drugs, akathisia caused suicide, whatever my signs were. But um, 
I didn't know AFSP is drug funded to a great extent. Uh, you know, all drug companies do money laundering and so do AstroTurf nonprofits that aren't really nonprofits, but they're more like, uh, you know, I guess AstroTurf, very slick and dirty. But um, you can read on that a bit of my blog, Mortier never got back with me. And now you can go on the AFSP website and you won't see if you find Akathisia information, you'll be lucky. It'll be a needle on a haystack, even if it's there. And let's not even talk about the black box boarding. But I did want to say real quick that um, but the pharmaceutical companies are teaching your child's health care class. And I know this from a teacher in decades. I was also at central office in Fairfax County Public Schools. I don't have the link here, but I will share it with you, Angie. You can go on YouTube. I'll share that link. It was a colleague of mine who I respected, a marketing teacher out of Fairfax High School DECA in Fairfax, Virginia. We were encouraged as uh, marketing teachers to have guest speakers. And many of those guest speakers, guess where they come from? Pharma. Because what you can see is on Mental Health Awareness Day or you know Depression Awareness Day or whatever these fake nonprofits have designated as a way to push their products. She invited a speaker from NAMI, the National Alliance for Mentally Ill or whatever. And I'm going to post that if it's still up. And the poor high school students who are getting their mental health instruction that day straight from NAMI, which is straight from the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, the instructor was asked about depression by one of the students, 14, 15. And of course, you know what the answer was. Chemical imbalance, drugs, drugs help me. And I will say too, I have uh, friends who take psychiatric prescriptions and it's not for me to tell them what to take or not take. As Kevin P. Miller says, it's medical freedom of choice and you don't have medical freedom of choice if you don't have all the information. And you're never gonna have all the information if doctors don't demand and consumers don't demand and the FDA doesn't get its act together and really do what they're supposed to do, which is protect, uh, to protect real people. But without the transparency of the clinical drug trials, even the doctors don't know what they're prescribing and what it, what it would do to a person. But back to AFSP, uh, there's a lot of different ways that the pharmaceutical companies are in the teen mental health field. And there's a lot of different ways that your child or your niece or your cousin's kids get educated by the pharmaceutical industry. And the money laundering is sometimes hard to track, but the money is there for NAMI and AFSP. And I would just urge parents to make sure that if somebody's teaching your kid at school or there's a guest speaker that you have a right to find out where they're from and what they're gonna say, because um, it's, 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 it's dangerous how the industry tries to capture consumers at a young age. Mm. Yeah, so let's let's shift there because I've been wanting to talk about this for a really long time. We meet a lot of parents with teens that are having issues, troubles. It seems like, you know, 13 to 15, you, you're trying to find yourself, you're very emotional, the hormones, you know, trying to find your identity. Uh, so teen mental health is like, you know, bigger than ever being right. talked about everywhere. So you, ha you have an, a professional and personal background in childhood development and education. So another phenomenon I've noticed is like teens are really identifying with their diagnosis rather than saying like, I have, you know, I have depressive symptoms sometimes. It's like, I have depression. I am bipolar. I am, it's almost like that's their identity and I did it myself. So I can relate to that, you know, but, right. but with all of our treatments and all of our screening tools, teen suicide is higher than ever. So can right. we talk about what should, what are, what should we be, we be doing in teen mental health that we're not doing and what are we doing that shouldn't be being done besides I appreciate, the, uh, all appreciate the question very much so some of the takeaways are um we when i say that i'm not i'm not i am not for promoting drugs and pharmaceutical products for teens and pretending that that is mental health care and i'm not for these screening programs that are designed to get consumers at an early age. What I am for is, real, is realizing and educating children to know that it's a, it's a confusing time of life and it's an exciting time of life where you're exploring so many different um, possibilities about yourself in the present and the future, whether it's gender, or whether it's uh, girlfriend, boyfriend, whether it's what you want to do with your life, whether it's difficulties at home if parents have 
troubles. So what I would like to say is that we need to realize the Medicating Normal documentary is just so aptly named to have two words just describe such a system as I, I as a word person myself. I love the love the documentary and I also love the title, but we need to let kids know that it is okay to have feelings of the blues. It is okay to be confused. Um, everybody probably at times thinks about what would happen if I wasn't here. That doesn't mean that because you have a suicidal type thought that you're suicidal, not that I'm not for helping people in crisis, but the bigger thing is this, we need to stop telling kids that when they have these feelings that they are broken and mentally ill and their brain is deformed and you just didn't know it when you were one to 16, but all of a sudden you have some brain disorder that's a chemical imbalance, but we can't really tell you what it is and we don't test for it. And it's just a hunch, but take this very, very dangerous product on my hunch. I mean, when you put it all in line, it's, it's, it's really, really sick. But what I'd like to say is that um, there are a lot of alternative approaches to helping kids through difficult times. Natalie loved art. If somebody had ever suggested art therapy, and I didn't know about art therapy in 2004, but boy, that would have been a great, great um, possible choice. Or somebody saying, like we said, what happened to you? When did you start feeling this way? Is there anything that happened to you before you, was there a chain, you know? But when you, I wanna to get to something about epiphanies of alienation and it comes back to this. So Natalie realized that she was increasingly disconnected from herself. She even says in Kevin P. Miller's wonderful mini documentary, and Kevin did this with Natalie's diaries, how he did it, I don't know, because he put together a documentary with words and phrases Natalie used that even I and my trauma wasn't always familiar that she had done, but they were all her words. But Natalie says in that uh, letters from Generation RX or rather another world, which was from the full cut of letters. She says that, you know, I was different before. I have changed chemically, neurologically, who knows? But she knew that she was increasingly alien, alien from herself. And I would just say that when they get disconnected from their own feelings of what they consider to be normal emotional responses, and then they get a drug that makes them more uh, emotionally disconnected, possibly manic, which they were not manic, but they'll get labeled. It's a, the alienation is the disconnect part. And there's a medical anthropologist I know very well who says that the common pattern with some of these victims, even if they don't die, that akathisia suffers, you know, when they realize that they're losing touch with themselves, she called her paper, The Siren Call of Akathisia, SSRI Induced Toxicity. And I think that's really important for us to realize is that these are drug toxicities. And I have people who've told me, well, my child did great on such and such. And I think to myself, okay, I don't want to talk to you about why you may or may think that. And I don't want to tell you about dependency or about how they stopped it and why I, I'm not here to ever tell someone their truth is wrong, but I will, I will share accurate information to say, why they may have done better when they got back on it than when they stopped. But what I will say is this, it comes back to school. When I was a teacher, I was not allowed to bring nut products in the classroom. And the reason I wasn't allowed to bring nut products in the classroom is because some of my students might not have left my classroom walking. They might've left in an ambulance or a body bag. So I recognize the severity of nut allergies for my students. And every year I would painstakingly look at my 160. I taught fashion marketing and sports marketing and global marketing. So I had to high school students, but I had painstakingly looked to see who might be at risk for that. And I say that um, there are no clinical trials that I know of that really show accurately, not because I say it to be true, but because I haven't seen them that show that these SSRIs are beneficial for children. I just haven't seen one. And if I, if I do see one, I would want to know all the data. Where, where's all the trials? But what I will say is this. So if I gave peanuts out in my classroom when I was a marketing teacher coordinator at Fairfax County Schools and somebody died or went to the hospital, 
do, could I look at their parents and say, you know what, I love Melanie. She was such a good student. I looked at her like she was my own daughter. I'm sorry that she died of the peanut allergy, but I have to tell you that peanuts are inexpensive. They're a quick and cheap, easy form of protein. And 29 of my students out of 30 were fine with it. If that's not acceptable, then I have to say to the deniers, it's not acceptable to also tell me, I'm sorry if your child died, it is sad, but that doesn't happen to most people. Well, first of all, it happens to a lot more than you think. And second of all, it doesn't matter. It happened to mine. Right. Oh, that's painful. Yeah. yeah. So uh, one more question from me, and then we'll look at comments in the audience. Can you stay for a couple minutes over? Sure, sure, sure. sure. Okay, okay. I don't, we cannot get off of this episode without talking about Akathisia 101. Can you tell our audience what is it and what are, what's the course right now and what's the upcoming course that's going to be released soon? Yes, I can. And I do want to say that, you know, I, my views are my own always. I, I do consulting work for several different places and serve on a board, but I represent myself. So I like to say that as I'm not beholden to anybody else's, um, you know, narrative, although I agree with many of the things, the organizations I collaborate with. But what I will say is that Akathisia 101 was a collaboration between Wendy Dolan and myself. We produced it for the MIST Foundation. It's uh, mist.learnupon.co. Uh, uh, Dr. David Healy was one of the reviewers. And it's for anybody that has an interest in learning about akathisia. Um, it's for lay people, it's for parents like me, it's for your neighbors. So it's free, it's one hour, it's accredited by the National Association of Social Workers. The new course, which has been a real bear, but we're getting there, it will be a, a CME, it will offer certified medical education units, and it is geared more towards healthcare professionals. Um, it'll have much of the same content, uh, a little different format. It'll still be online. And another thing is that um, I'd say that uh, I'm happy that Akathisia is more in the news and more in uh, books and stuff because I was fortunate to be able to author a chapter uh, with MIST for an upcoming textbook about Akathisia. And also, I do want to give a shout out during the... Um, COVID epidemic, I was very isolated in a strange situation. And I was reading a book I was very much interested in, a draft copy. I didn't get to finish what I was gonna do with that book, but it was a fabulous book in that it really mirrored what I've spoken here about how AFSP is pharma funded and how they try to, as uh, one of the websites blog says, you know, they capture bereaved parents. I think that was Healy's blog. But if you haven't had a chance, I would check out some of the publishing. Uh, Malcabrist is a fiction novel, but when you read it, you'll see that it's um, based on the reality. And in Malcabrist, um, this novel about the pharmaceutical industry's deceit and follows a character. Um, Shabani is the woman's name, but anyway, it really talks about akathisia in a way that I was uh, impressed to see because it brings to light in a way that some people can uh, slowly partake in the truth. Mm -hmm. So there's one really good question from the audience. There's several, but we, we don't have time for all of them. So I want to ask this one that seems to be most important. How do we turn this tide? How do we convince prescribers that they, like us, have been duped by the pharmaceutical companies and regulators? And I'll add a line to that. Just how do we convince or I don't know, how do they believe us that our truth is what happened? This is what happened, that these drugs and the system, you know, the mental health care system hurt, hurts people well, like me and you. That's an excellent question. And I'm going to try to be succinct since our time is short. But uh, I would say one, one way is you don't give them any business. And it's hard because sometimes you don't find out your doctor is misinformed or, or harmful or dishonest until you've been harmed. But I would say if I could look back, I mean, now these, sometimes a story isn't a story until you reach the end, or you don't know a story is a story until you reach the end. But when I look back at the records and everything that happened, it's quite atrociously sad, but very common. So I would just say, one, um, share your truths and share the data. And if, if when you look at someone and you're explaining about akathisia or what happened to you, and they kind of have a glassy look, I always say the eyes are the window of the soul. And I'm very much better now at just being discerning on if I see someone's not really going to be open to accepting the truths, I, I move on. 
The next thing is um, bringing that information to your doctor. And also, uh, last but not least, please go on websites and, and vet your doctor. Some websites, MIST has tried to get a whole list of doctors who are experienced in identifying drug-induced toxicities and who don't prescribe these drugs. There is one thing real quick, a little bit off the topic, but I think it's important to get in today. So I was a very broken woman when my daughter was killed. And I, I've always been a woman that follows the golden rule to the best of my ability. And the golden rule was something that my classroom lived by. And I was featured in the paper as a good teacher. So I think my pedagogy and my instruction of the golden rule uh, helped many thousands of students over the years. But what I will say is this, when you're suffering terrible grief, whether you have a loved one that dies or you've been harmed yourself, you're desperate for, for truths and you're desperate to be believed and you're also very vulnerable. And I would just say that um, you've got to be careful because there are people on all sides of these issues who um, may have been vulnerable themselves, but maybe don't have your best interest at heart. And I'm not the only person that's experienced that. And I would just say, do your research, but be take a step back and take care of yourself and do some uh, healing before you jump into advocacy because you can easily be fooled in ways that are gaslighting injuries all over again. And I don't want that for anybody. And I would just say, be careful. The other thing is, um, briefly, I have to thank my deceased father and my mother who's still living is that they uh, weren't perfect parents, but they were good parents. There's a hundred ways to be, there's a million ways to be a good parent and not one way to be a perfect parent. But what I did want to say is that when I advocate now, I think about my parents and how thankful I am that they were socially progressive in terms of civil rights and and that old adage that, you know, I saw a sign and somebody, it says somebody should do something and you are somebody. So what I would say is, yes, I am somebody and I'm somebody who's trying to make a difference and you can make a difference in all different ways. It doesn't have to be public. You don't have to be on TV or on a board or wherever. Just share your truths because everybody has values and everybody's story matters and everybody's story can save one person. And, and Natalie was the world to me. So so if I can save one person, I've saved somebody else's world. And we all have that power. And don't let somebody with a diploma or a degree or a, a mouthpiece, don't let them take away your power to make a difference because we all can and should and have a responsibility to speak our truths. That's a beautiful way to end. Wow. So thank you, Christina, for sharing um, about you, your advocacy, your daughter, and leaving us with those good thoughts that, you know, we just have to keep talking about it because this is our truth, you know? So yeah, thank you. We're not magicians, but we are truth tellers. We are, we are. So to everybody in the audience, thank you so much for joining us today. I want to read to you a few of the upcoming episodes we have. We have best for more. We're going to be talking about mad activism and psychiatric abolition. That's next week. Uh, the week after is Avani Dilger. She is one of my favorite people in the whole world, just like Christina and Wendy. She does a, a lot about teen mental health and, and she runs an organization called Natural Highs. Then September 17th, we have Cindy Fisher, who is fighting for her son's uh, release from Western State Hospital, and she's doing a hunger strike. And then the week after that, we have conversation with Avis Avtab, who is a traditional psychiatrist and we're going to be talking to all these people coming up so please tune in if you could do me a huge favor could you please like us on facebook and follow us on youtube it really helps the algorithm you know we're playing with this social media life but it really helps us if you like the video you follow us you like us you know share it please do that for me all right so lastly um if you haven't seen the film medicaid normal yet please do so you can watch it on medicaidnormal.com there is a, 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 a little tab at the top that says watch and please share it with your friends also. And lastly, uh, just, I just want to say thank you again to Christina. Thank you for all you do. I'm, I have huge hopes for Akathisia 101 that, you know, medical people start taking it, EMS people take it so that if you're in a crisis sure. and a police officer shows up, they can say, wow, this is Akathisia. Let's you know, help this person and really, Absolutely. you know, that's my hope that Akathisia 101 is like part of medical curriculum someday. One, one word that can save lives, but I want to say thank you to you. I'm sorry for your suffering. I appreciate your service to our country. And I also am very grateful that you're still here and interested and able and effective advocate. 
Well, thank you, Christina. That means a lot to me. All right, everybody. I'll see you next week. Uh, take care. Stay in the fight. It's their healing is is inevitable. I see some people in the comments asking about, am I going to get better? Yes, you absolutely will. I'm a living testament. You you will. You just hang in there. All right. Talk to y'all later. Bye bye. Bye bye.